USA. He is well known worldwide for being one of the three joint winners of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 1998 for their discoveries concerning nitric oxide as a signaling molecule in the cardiovascular system. His expertise is on cyclase inhibitors for bacterial toxin-induced diarrhea, effects of nitric oxide and or cyclic GMP on cancer proliferation, effects of nitric oxide and cyclic GMP on embryonic stem cell proliferation and differentiation. Dr. Farid Murad is currently professor at the Department of Medicine, Stanford University and senior advisor at Stanford's Veterans Administration Hospital. He was a professor at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, Biochemistry and Molecular Medicine, George Washington University from April 2011 to 2016. Dr. Murad has served in the University of Texas at Houston as director of the Brown Foundation Institute of Molecular Medicine for the Prevention of Human Diseases and director of the Intracellular Signaling Program of the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston from 1997 to 2011. He also served as Vice President of Research and Development and Corporate Officer at Abbott Laboratories from 1988 to 1993. At Stanford University between 1981 and 1988, Dr. Murad was the Chief of Medicine at the Palo Alto VA Medical Center, 1981-1986, Associate Chairman in the Department of Medicine, Stanford University, 1984-86, and Acting Chairman, Department of Medicine and Acting Division Chief, Division of Respiratory Medicine from 1986-88. to He has also served as Director and Professor of the Clinical Research Center and Division of Clinical Pharmacology, at the University of Virginia, Professor of Medicine and Pharmacology at Stanford University, Chief Physician at Palo Alto VA Hospital, Vice Chairman and Chairman of Stanford Medical School, 1970-1981. Since 1997, Dr. Murad has been a member of the National Academy of Sciences and its, and its Institute of Medicine, Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, member of the Texas Academy of Medicine, Engineering and Scientific Technology. In 2007, he was the foreign academician at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Besides the prestigious Nobel Prize, Dr. Murad has won numerous other awards, such as the Albert and Mary Lasker Basic Medical Research Award, the American Heart Association SIBA Award, Baxter Award for Distinguished Research in the Biomedical Sciences from the Association of American Medical Colleges, the American Society of Clinical Pharmacology Research Award, and 17 honorary degrees and numerous honorary professorship and member of many universities and societies. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Dr. Farid Murad to deliver his talk. Discovery of nitric oxide and cyclic GNT in cell signaling and their role in drug development, today's title.
<laughs> well, I want to thank you for inviting me to visit your university. <clears throat> I've been <clears throat> to Malaysia, I think, twice before. Uh, I was trying to develop a collaboration with the University of Technology here in Kuala Lumpur uh, about six or seven years ago. And it, we came close. We signed a, a, a memorandum, but, but never materialized. I'm not sure why. But I've been to Singapore several times as well. So I, I've been to this part of the world. I do an awful lot of traveling, like many Nobel laureates. I was telling someone earlier, I've been in airplanes for two and a half million miles. That's a lot of miles. And I've probably been to 80 different countries. Uh, some of them, such as China or Japan, 20, 30 times or more. Uh, anyway, you get tired. <laughs> I'm pleased to be here and tell you about my research. I want to tell you how I got started with messenger molecules how we discovered nitric oxide, which started really as an accident, uh, and where the field is going. I began doing research with cyclic AMP as a medical student and graduate student. Uh, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland was the first university in the US to develop a combined MD-PhD program, and I found that very appealing and joined the program in 1958. And my advisors were, were Earl Sutherland, who was chairman of pharmacology, and Ted Rawl, a young assistant professor who helped work in his laboratory as a collaborator. And they had just discovered cyclic AMP. And it was looking like a very exciting system to understand the mechanism of hormone action. And we appreciated that it was going to lead into all sorts of interesting areas of biochemistry and pharmacology. So that's how I got started. And as a student, found many, many hormones regulating cyclic AMP production in many tissues. And one of my mentors, Earl Sutherland, got the Nobel Prize in 1971 for discovering cyclic AMP. I believe that as life began in the deep crypts of the ocean, and we're now beginning to think that maybe it even came from alien planets to sort of fertilize this world with, with the right chemicals and maybe the genes and organisms to get us all started. But that the life was very simple. And as life began, the cells had to coagulate and became, become multicellular to talk to each other. And in the process of talking to each other, they had to live in this very toxic environment with all the magma boiling out of the earth with transition metals and gases and everything else. And organisms are clever, and they adapt to their environment, and begin to use some of these molecules as messenger molecules. I can't prove that, because I can't design the, product, the, the correct experiment to go back and test that concept. But I do believe that's probably how things got started. Today we know that in all the animals and humans, it's very important for your cells to talk to each other. They have to communicate. And they regulate each other's biochemistry, physiology, and biology. And that concept is summarized in the very first slide here. These are three different cell types that are going to communicate with each other. It doesn't matter what the cells are, but I'm going to call cell type 1 a neuronal cell. It could be a central neuron in your brain, it could be a peripheral neuron in your fingertip or toe. It's going to produce a substance to talk to cell type 2. And when this substance comes from a neuron, we call it a neurotransmitter. And it's released into the synaptic space or into the bloodstream. And it's going to go looking for cell type 2. Cell type 2, I will call an endothelial cell lining the wall of your blood vessels. If you look at this thin layer inside of all your arteries and veins, and add up all those cells, it's one of the largest organs in the body, probably bigger than the liver or heart or brain. And we used to think it was inactive and didn't do much, but we've learned now that's not true. It produces also lots of interesting messenger molecules. And it produces a substance 
that leaves the endothelial cell to go to the adjacent cell, the smooth muscle cell, and the wall of that blood vessel and regulate its contraction. It causes dilation, as discovered by Robert Furchka, one of my friends, and, and shared the Nobel Prize with me in 98. Now, if cell type 1 is an, is an endocrine cell, we call the messenger a hormone. If it's a lymphocyte or a macrophage, we call them growth factors, cytokines, chemokines. So these substances are quite different in structure. Some are very simple, some are more complicated. The gonadotropins are really sort of large peptides or proteins. So they can be very, very simple or quite complex. But the concept is the same. They're messengers. And there are dozens and dozens of these messengers coming from a variety of different cells because of their differentiation and epigenetic regulation of their biology. They leave the cell into the bloodstream and identify their target. It's like sending an email out and it only goes to the right place with the right address. And these molecules only identify the cell that has the right protein in their cell membrane that we call a receptor. So the specificity of the communication is based on the structure of the first messenger and also the structure of the receptor so there's a three-dimensional conformational fit of the two molecules, like a key and a lock. Now the messenger doesn't necessarily have to go inside of the cell to do its business. Its interaction with the receptor induces a biochemical cascade in the membrane of that cell to produce an intracellular second messenger. And the first second messenger discovered was cycle GMP in 1957. Subsequently, we've identified other intracellular second messengers, cyclic like GMP, calcium, diisoglycerol, some peptides, the acosinoids, the prostaglandins, and my favorite, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is very unique because it's a gas, it's a reactive species and free radical with only one electron in its outer shell. So when it collides with another molecule, it steals an electron, creating another free radical to fulfill its outer shell with a pair of electrons. But it's also lipid soluble. It can go into the mitochondria, it can go into the nucleus, it can come out of the cell and go back in, or it can go off to neighboring cells. None of the other messengers can do that. Other messengers, if they're gonna move around and be transported, they require carriers or transporters. That's not true in nitric oxide. Also with other messengers, the primary first messengers, or some of the intracellular second messengers, there are pools. You have puddles or storage sites for them. Not true in nitric oxide. It's got a very short half-life because it's a free radical and very reactive. So you make it as you need it, which makes it quite different as well. And I'll review the story as to how we discovered this unusual molecule and where it's going. We know today that there are drugs that are pro-drugs or precursors that result in the formation of nitric oxide. And that helped us identify nitric oxide in tissues and cells. Nitroglycerin and nitroprusside, very important drugs that we use to lower blood pressure in patients. And because of that, it helped me figure out what the, this messenger was. But we also know that it's a pollutant. It's an automobile exhaust. It comes from smokestacks. It's in tobacco smoke. So anything with nitrogen in its structure, when it's combusted with oxygen, forms a family of nitrogen oxides. NO, NO2, N2O3, etc. These are all pollutant toxic materials. They get up in the atmosphere and they interact with ozone and ble deplete the ozone layer. And ozone is very important because it's an ultraviolet filter for the ultraviolet rays from the sun. And when you lose ozone, you have global warming. So for many years, the nitrogen oxides were thought to be bad guys. They're pollutants, they're bad chemicals. And when we came along and said, no, they're also important messengers, nobody would believe us. And it took me 10 or 12 years to convince the world it was important, so it was a long delay. You know, usually you don't have to wait 20 years to get a Nobel Prize, but I had to wait a long time. 
because nobody wanted to believe what we were doing. Well, we know today, we published, we discovered nitric oxide for the first time in December 1976, and I'll tell you how we did that. We published our first papers in 1977 and 78. Today, 40 years later, there are 160,000 research papers in nitric oxide. It's incredible. And it, it's become one of the more important areas in medical research. And why is that? Because it regulates lots of things and processes. It regulates a lot of biochemistry, a lot of physiology, a lot of biology. And it's led to the development of a lot of important drugs. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And that's what I do. I'm trained in pharmacology and biochemistry, and I'm a clinical pharmacologist. I do a lot of biochemistry in order to discover and develop drugs. By understanding the pathways, I can predict, and I screen chemical libraries, I can go find novel drugs, and I know enough about medicine to figure out where they're going to be useful. And that's what I do. This is a partial list of some of the things it does on the right, but it's an incomplete list, and I'll tell you more towards the end of the talk about some of the other things it does. I told you that I began, I grew up working with adenoid cyclase, cyclic AMP. I was the one who figured out a lot of hormones that were working through cyclic AMP. And then in the late 1960s, uh, as I was finishing my training, Cyclic GMP was discovered in the urine of rabbits by some chemists. And a couple of us in the cyclic AMP field said, we better look at cyclic GMP. It might also be another intracellular messenger. And a couple of us began to work with cyclic GMP. And that happened as I was leaving Virginia and going to the university, leaving, leaving the NIH, going to the University of Virginia to develop a clinical pharmacology unit and also to supervised the clinical research center for the medical school. And I switched my interest from cyclic AMP to cyclic GMP. And we discovered that yes, there is an enzyme called guanylate cyclase, or guanylyl cyclase, that converts GDP to cyclic GMP. And the biochemistry is very, very similar to the adenylate cyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic GMP. In fact, there's homology between the enzyme. The catalytic domains are quite similar. Not identical, but very, very similar to each other. We also learned very quickly that there are multiple isoforms of guanylate cyclase, different gene products to make cyclic GMP. There are about seven different isoforms of the enzyme. There's a soluble isoform, which is a heterodimer, and there are six particulate isoforms that are receptors for other molecules, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. <clears throat> With adenylate cyclase, that's not the case. You only have one isoform. Guanylate cyclase is much more complicated, which I thought made it a lot more interesting and fun. And the question I ask is, is it regulated? Are the guanylate cyclase regulated by hormones? How do we figure that out? Because if we understood how hormones did it, perhaps we could intervene to make hormones more effective or less effective to treat various endocrine disorders. We also want to know what cyclic GMP was doing biologically. No, no one knew. No one knew if hormones regulated it. No one knew what the product cyclic GMP was doing biologically. When cyclic nucleotides are produced in various tissues, cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP, they're inactivated by a family of enzymes called cyclic nucleotide phosphodiesterases. There's 11 different isoforms in this enzyme, 11 gene products. Some selectively hydrolyze cyclic AMP by cleaving the phosphodiester bond. Some selectively cleave the phosphodiester bond and cyclic GMP. Some of the enzymes work on both cyclic nucleotides. It makes it complicated, but with complexity comes a lot more opportunity to discover drugs and control biology. I find things complicated more fun to deal with because you have multiple ways to change that biological response. And what you have to do, however, is create chemicals that are very selective for one isoform or the other. And that takes a lot of work to do sometimes. The isoform of phosphodiesterase that you're all familiar with is 
the type 5 phosphodiesterase, which cleaves cyclic GMP, found in all of our blood vessels. And that's how Viagra works. It inhibits that enzyme to permit more cyclic GMP to be increased and produced in the blood vessel wall to cause dilation of the blood vessels in the penis so that blood vessels can fill with blood and cause an erection. I thought about that back in the 1980s, early 1980s, but I thought it was a trivial medical problem, so I didn't focus on it. I went off in another direction. I should have worked on it. I would have made a ton of money. Because my act has turned out to be a very popular drug. It sells probably more than $2 billion a year, which is incredible. And it's now become a street drug almost. <clears throat> the second messenger, cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, diisoglycerol, calcium, produce their biological effects by regulating protein kinases. <clears throat> there are families of protein kinases. There are dozens and dozens of protein kinases. Some are regulated by calcium and carbomodulin, some are regulated by cyclic AMP, some by cyclic GMP, some by diisoglycerol. And what these kinases do is they take the terminal phosphate off of ATP and put it onto a serine or threonine residue of a protein. That's how many of these messengers work. However, there are other protein kinases that take the phosphate and put it on a serine residue. They're tyrosine kinases. They're not cyclic nucleotide protein kinases. The tyrosine kinases are not regulated by second messengers. They're regulated by growth factors and cytokines. In fact, some of them are receptors for some of these regulatory proteins. When the protein is phosphorylated, its biological activity changes. If it's a structural protein, its motility may change. It may change the shape of the cell. It may present phagocytosis of an adjacent cell. If it's an enzyme, it can be activated or inhibited. So this is basically the mechanism of signal transduction. A messenger regulates the production of a messenger inside of the cell, which regulates one or another protein kinase to phosphorylate a gene because altered transcription, a regulatory factor of the genes, a protein that may influence lipid metabolism or carbohydrate metabolism. That's basically it. It's pretty simple. The problem is is all these isoforms that are talking to each other, which makes it a little bit more complicated. And you have to go looking for compounds that are selected for one isoform or the other to create specificity in your therapeutic approach to as we studied guanine cyclase, we found that there were differences in, in the kinetic and biochemical properties of the soluble isoforms and the particulate isoforms. And we accidentally found that we could activate the enzyme by sodium azide, sodium nitrite, and, and hydroxylamine. We used to put azide in our buffers because it has antibacterial properties, and we would store our buffers in the refrigerator or cold room when we didn't want bacterial growth. And we accidentally discovered that azide would activate the enzyme, the soluble isoform of the enzyme. Big surprise. We were hoping to find that hormones would activate the enzyme. We knew that hormones could increase cyclic GMP production in intact cells and intact tissue, but it wouldn't activate the enzyme in extracts or homogenates. We disrupted the signaling pathway. And because azide would activate, I said, if we understand how it works, maybe we'll be clever enough to reconstitute a hormone effect. My goal was to find new hormones that regulate cyclic GMP as opposed to cyclic AMP and could we alter their activation of cyclic GMP by enhancing it or inhibiting it to treat various endocrine diseases? A new approach to endocrinology. That's what I was hoping. Um, you know, there are diabetes, there are adrenal tumors, there are pituitary tumors that either make too much or too little hormone, and you have a, a, a problem with endocrinology in the patient. Well, it turned out that azide would activate the soluble fraction from liver, and you see it activates 15-fold. With heart, there was no effect. With cerebral cortex extracts, no effect. Because we were working with soluble fractions, we mixed them. We mixed liver with heart, the azide effect disappeared. And that's because 
heart possessed an inhibitor that blocked the effect of azide on the liver inside. We purified that inhibitor. It turned out to be two inhibitors, hemoglobin and myoglobin. A very important finding, and I'll tell you why shortly. We mixed the liver with cerebral cortex. The azide effect was enhanced because liver converted azide to an activator that could activate the soluble cyclase contributed by the liver and the soluble cyclase contributed by cerebral cortex. So we enhanced the effect. It was additive. So doing these mixing and matching experiments gave us some biological, biochemical clues as to how to approach the azide problem. In the process, <coughs> we began to put azide, hydroxylamine, and sodium nitride on cell cultures and tissue slices to increase cyclic GMP accumulation. And one of the tissues I worked with was tracheal smooth muscle. I knew as a student that smooth muscle was relaxed by cyclic AMP, vascular smooth muscle, airway smooth muscle. And I thought cyclic GMP would cause contraction of smooth muscle. It would antagonize the effects of cyclic AMP. We put azide on these tracheal smooth muscle segments in the organ bath. Cyclic GMP levels were elevated, but the tissue didn't contract. It relaxed. Big surprise. The opposite of what we expected. And then I remembered as an intern and resident taking care of patients in the intensive care unit with heart attacks, that we would give them intravenous nitroglycerin or nitroprusside to lower their blood pressure. We call it decreasing afterload. The, the blood pressure lowering allowed the heart to work less hard and heal faster. <coughs> so I told the fellows in the laboratory, why don't you put some nitroglycerin or nitroprusside on these tracheal smooth muscle segments in the organ bath because they'll relax and let's see what's happening to cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP. And what happened, I thought that cyclic GMP would go down, cyclic AMP would go up to cause relaxation. I was wrong again. Nitroglycerin and nitroprusside activated myelin cyclase, increased cyclic GMP. And we realized over the course of a couple of months that cyclic GMP was a smooth muscle relaxant, just as was cyclic AMP. And that was a big clue. Okay? So now we had a number of agents with nitrogen in its structure who were activators of soluble myelin cyclase. Azide, hydroxylamine, sodium nitrite, nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, and we tested a bunch of organic and inorganic nitrites and nitrates. They're all prodrugs or precursors. And we wondered what is the active factor activating myelin cyclase. And because hemoglobin was an inhibitor, we thought the intermediate activator was nitric oxide because it was known in the chemical literature the hemoglobin is the scavenger of nitric oxide. It has a very high affinity. So sure enough, we generated nitric oxide in the laboratory by mixing sodium nitrite, ferrous sulfate, sulfuric acid. We made nitric oxide gas, vented the gas into our cyclase incubations, and it activated all of the squamulate cyclase incubations that we tested. That was a eureka moment. <coughs> early, Jan early December 1976. We discovered that a free radical in the gas could activate an enzyme. That had never been demonstrated before. We were quite excited about it. And we knew now that we could generate it in a variety of ways, and we could block it in a variety of ways. And the question now was, what does nitric oxide, by increasing cyclic GMP, do in the tissues and cells? What is its biological effect? So we began looking at a variety of things. And about this time, people finally got excited about what we were doing because we demonstrated that nitric oxide was coming out of the endothelium and blood vessels to cause vasodilation and relaxation and hypotension. They finally said, and they realized that, yes, nitric oxide is an endogenous messenger. It's not a pollutant and toxic material, well, necessarily. It does other important things. This is what a nitro vasodilator will do to a vascular preparation. This is a radiortis segment in an organ bath. We add nitroglycerin or nitroprusside or another NO donor. Within 10 or 20 seconds, cyclic GMP levels begin to increase because it activates the soluble isoform of one cyclase. The levels peak in one or two minutes. If we add a phosphodiesterase inhibitor like Viagra, the peak is higher, lasts longer, and then it decays 
And this is followed by relaxation of the smooth muscle. But notice that the smooth muscle relaxation persists for 10 or 20 minutes, even though cyclic GMP has returned to basal levels. Is it because cyclic GMP is not related to relaxation? No, that's not what happens. The messenger, nitric oxide, cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, calcium, are very short-lived. And they turn on biochemical pathways which have much longer half-lives. The activation of protein kinase lasts for a long time. The phosphorylation of proteins lasts for a long time. So the biological effect can go on for some period of time. And people in the field at this point in time, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, were looking at the wrong times trying to correlate it with biology. They were missing the peaks and looking too late. And at that point, the cyclic nucleotides were not elevated. They were already back down to basal levels. So we proposed in 1978 in some review articles that we figured out how, nit how nitroglycerin and nitroprusside work as vasodilators. And that's because they're precursors or prodrugs to form nitric oxide. Now, in pharmacology, when you have an agent that does something of interest, you should ask yourself, is it mimicking an endogenous pathway? The fact that opiates influence the brain suggested to some scientists, the neurobiologists, the chemists, maybe there are endogenous substances that regulate pain and effects in the brain, as the opiates do, and that led to the discovery of the encephalons. There are many examples of that in the literature, where a biological agent, a toxin or something else, does something, leading the scientist to go look for it in the biological sample and finding it. So we proposed in 1978 that nitric oxide was going to be a messenger molecule produced by tissues. It was certainly produced by various nitrovasodilators, the term that we coined. But the question is, is it there normally? Is it regulated? And does that cr control a lot of biological responses? People thought we were crazy. A free radical, a gas, cannot be a regulator, can't be a messenger. Well, we were right, they were wrong. The problem is it took us a long time to prove that. And that's because the concentration of nitric oxide to do these interesting things was extremely low. Nanomolar concentrations. There was no technology for us to measure nitric oxide in tissues at nanomolar concentrations. The, the metabolites, nitrite and nitrate, couldn't be examined either because those were crude colorimetric assays that worked at the millimolar range. So we had to go create new technology to prove that nitric oxide was there normally in tissues. And we succeeded, but it took us a few years to do that as well. In 1980, Robert Furchgott, a vascular biologist from Brooklyn in SUNY Downstate, found that acetylcholine, histamine, and some other substances relaxed vascular segments for the first time. We knew that these substances would lower blood pressure in animals or patients. They were vasodilators. But in the organ bath, with vascular segments from rabbit or rat or other two species, they had no effect. And that's because the endothelium was damaged in the process of making the preparation. The endothelium is a very fragile, thin layer. And it's very easy to destroy it and damage it. And if you're careful to preserve it, it releases a substance when acetylcholine or histamine are added. And this substance, he called endothelial-derived relaxant factor. He presented a seminar in 1980 in the spring. I was at his seminar because I was still in Virginia. And I was really quite excited about his work because this endothelial-derived relaxant factor, EDRF, that was coming out of blood vessels under the influence of acetylcholine or histamine was labile and a short half-life. And it was blocked by the blockers that we were used to block azide activation in other tissues, hemoglobin and myoglobin. And I caught him after his seminar and I said, let's figure out what EDRF is. It's going to be a reactive species, maybe a free radical, maybe nitric oxide, and it might work through cyclic G or cyclic AMP. Let's figure this out. He returned to New York. His wife developed breast cancer. We never did, I moved to Stanford. We never collaborated. But after being at Stanford for a while, we decided to do the experiments ourselves, and sure enough, we were right, and this is our experiment. 
EDRF is nitric oxide, and it increases the cycle GFP production in the vascular smooth muscle, that's how it causes relaxation. So it's EDRF is nitric oxide. Now then, this told us how to treat patients with problems, with myocardial infarction, with strokes, whatever. How do we control their blood pressure and blood flow? You can't use endothelial dependent vasodilators because in those patients, and I'll tell you later, their endothelium is not making the proper nitric oxide for a variety of biochemical reasons. You have to treat them with direct acting vasodilators that work directly on the smooth muscle and not up through the endothelium. So it tells us how to treat patients. Okay, this is put together for you in this cartoon. On the left is the endothelial layer of blood vessels, and on the right is the smooth muscle compartment in the wall of that blood vessel. In red are three categories of vasodilators that work by increasing the production of cyclic GMP. The nitrovasodilators are prodrugs or precursors that are converted to nitric oxide. Some of them are converted spontaneously depending on the oxygen tension or pH of blood. Some of them require an enzyme to convert, like nitroglycerin has an enzyme that converts it to NO. The NO activates the soluble isoformic monoline cyclase to make cyclic GMP. The cyclic GMP activates the cyclic GMP dependent protein kinase. This then phosphorylates a variety of smooth muscle proteins that you can identify by P32 incorporation in the muscles and 2 gels and see what protein spots it. P32 incorporation and sequencing those proteins. And those phosphorylated proteins regulate the concentration of calcium in the cell by lowering it. And calcium is required for the activity of myosin light chain kinase. Myosin light chain kinase transfers terminal phosphate of ATP to the myosin light chain. When you dephosphorylate, they slide apart to have relaxation. That took, us another, that took us another couple of years to figure out. So now we have the whole pathway for smooth muscle relaxation mediated by cyclic KMP, cyclic GMP, and calcium. And then it turns out that Furchgott's EDRF, made by the endothelium, works the same way because it's nitric oxide. But why does it require the integrity of the endothelium? That's because that's where the receptors are. The receptors for histamine, acetylcholine, bradykinin, and other reagents are only on the endothelium, not on the smooth muscle. So when a patient has, an art, has a heart attack and they have endothelial dysfunction, which many do, you have to use direct acting vasodilators on the blank nitroglycerin nitroprusside to decrease afterload. The endothelial dependent vasodilators don't work very well in those patients. A couple of other laboratories were doing obviously important experiments in the 1980s. They provided some clues for us. It turns out the enzyme that makes nitric oxide is called nitric oxide synthase, and there are three different gene products, three isoforms, NOS1, 2, and 3. NOS2, and they have about 50 or 60 percent homology with each other. And they use a, a very complicated array of cofactors. And NOS2 is very interesting because its gene expression can be influenced by NF-kappa B, which is regulated by pro-inflammatory cytokines. Normally, your tissues don't have NOS2 transcript or protein. However, if there's been inflammation with endotoxin, IL-1, interferon, gamma, activating NF-kappa B, you then regulate and enhance the expression of NOS2. So if there's NOS2 transcript or protein, there's been inflammation in that tissue. Whether the inflammation is Alzheimer's plaques, myocarditis, miliitis, pancreatitis, nephritis, I don't care what it is, you have increased NOS2 and you make a lot of it up. It's a high output pathway for NO production. And a lot of NO can cause problems. With all these messengers, if you have too little, you have a problem. If you have too much, you have a problem. It's like the Goldilocks story. You want to have just the right amount at the right time in the right place so that it's beneficial, okay? And that's the way biology works. There are ways to regulate these messengers to go up or go down and keep them 
you at the right levels to, import, to accomplish the important things. And if when it gets out of whack, you have disease. This is the pathway for these enzymes. It converts the terminal group of uh, arginine, L-arginine, the stick figure, uh, by nitric oxide synthase. It oxidizes one of those nitrogens to a hydroxy arginine, and that further is oxidized to form citrullated nitric, nitric oxide. The enzyme not only uses arginine as substrate, it requires NADPH and oxygen. It's a heme-containing protein. It's regulated by calcium calmodulin, and it's also regulated by flavines, FMN and FAD, and, and uh, tetrahydrobiopterin. So it's a very complicated enzyme. But by understanding all of the cofactors, you can now play games by regulating the availability of these cofactors, or substrates, to influence the activity of the enzyme to make it up. And that's very important. Why is it important? I'll tell you shortly. So let me put this whole pathway together for you now. A variety of messengers combine with their receptors to regulate the production of various intracellular messengers. And in some cases, they regulate one-line cyclase, the soluble isoform, or the particulate isoforms, which are regulated by other activators. Peptins, which we didn't talk about, E. coli neurotoxins, some of the enzymes that are, some of the hormones that are made in the intestinal tract, one-one neurogram. All this came out of our research doing the biochemistry. So nitric oxide synthase converts arginine to citrulline and NO. The NO activates soluble quinoline cyclase to make cyclic G, which activates a kinase, which phosphorylates a protein. You get a biological effect. Each step in the pathway becomes a molecular target. You can take those enzymes and screen chemical libraries going fishing, looking for chemical leads to find drugs. And that's what we do. So I do a lot of biochemistry, but I'm a drug hunter. I want to go find new novel drugs. And I've also found that a lot of traditional Chinese medicines work through these pathways. And that's another story. Quite a few of them work through nitric oxide cycle GMP, and I predicted that was going to be the case. Now, nitric oxide can go off in other directions. It not only activates quinoline cyclase, it can be converted and oxidized to nitrite or nitrate. The levels of nitrite and nitrate in blood, spinal fluid, or urine can be an index of nitric oxide production. It's difficult to measure nitric oxide because it's very short-lived because it's very reactive. So we measure it indirectly by looking at the metabolites of nitrite and nitrate. We used to think they were inert, but that's not true anymore. They're reservoirs. They can be converted back to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide can also combine with other transition metals <coughs> besides iron. It loves iron, but it can combine with zinc and manganese and other transition metals. It can combine with thiol groups and proteins, the cysteine resonators. There are a few hundred proteins that get nitrosylated by nitric oxide. Their activities change when that happens. Another very important reaction is the combination of nitric oxide with another reactive species, superoxide anion. When you have inflammation, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, as I told you, increase the production of NOS2 to make more NO. But it also increases the production of superoxide reactive oxygen species that scavenge the NO. And when NO combines with superoxide, it forms peroxynitrite which is very, very toxic. It nitrates tyrosyl residues and blood proteins, blocking the tyrosine kinase signaling pathways. So these two signaling pathways, which are both very important to talking to each other, it makes it even more interesting in terms of drug discovery and treatment. All right, let's turn to some clinical utility of all this information. <coughs> Patients with hypertension, diabetes, <coughs> atherosclerosis, tobacco use, and probably obesity have blood vessels that do not make enough nitric oxide. And they don't make enough nitric oxide with this endothelial dysfunction because they're making an inhibitor of the pathway, another arginine analog, asymmetric dimethyl arginine, which blocks formation of nitric oxide. 
you can overcome the inhibition of asymmetric dimethyl arginine by increasing the arginine concentration. That's led to the formation of arginine and supplements of interest. So you over, because of the competitive inhibitor, you just overcome it with its natural substrate. Most of these disorders are also associated with reactive oxygen species, hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, etc. And they combine and block the effects of nitric oxide. So that now suggests that if we add antioxidants to these nutritional supplements, we can make them even more effective. And that's what's happening. So by all the biochemistry, we now can put together clever ways to treat patients with heart attacks, patients with strokes, I'll tell you about a lot of other diseases, and also perhaps improve hypertension, diabetes, and stress. We can't advertise that because we have to do all the clinical work to prove that they're effective. But I think that what they do is they enhance the efficacy of the other clinical therapy that is approved. If you're going to treat blood pressure, it would be nice to combine it with a nutritional supplement along with antihypertensives. And in some patients who have a mild disorder, the neutral, the nutritional supplements are often sufficient to treat the patient. Okay, let me go through a partial list of some of the biological effects that give you a flavor of where it's going. We know that nitric oxide is a neurotransmitter in the brain. It's a neurotransmitter of some nerves in the intestinal tract and the blood vessels in the penis. Uh, it's a vasodilator. Uh, it's responsible for the normal physiology with penile erection because the nerves in the penis liberate nitric oxide to make cyclogenp. It plays a role in angiogenesis. Why is that important? Well, it turns out that most cancers make a lot of nitric oxide because they have a lot of NOS2. They don't make much cyclo-GMP because the enzyme for cyclo-GMP, when one cyclase, is defective in cancers we found. So that nitric oxide regulates angiogenesis to make blood vessels to feed the tumors. So the tumors survive because of the angiogenic effects of nitric oxide coming out of the tumor to regulate the proliferation of blood vessels. They're talking to each other. If you block that pathway, you block the angiogenesis as an effective way to prevent tumor growth. So that's an approach now for cancer, a totally different approach for cancer therapy. It plays a role in atherogenesis uh, as well because it regulates free radical production. It's obviously effective in asthma because it relaxes the smooth muscle in the airways. Uh, we think it plays a role in septic shock. In septic shock <coughs> Some of the organisms release endotoxin. Endotoxin is a pro-inflammatory cytokine that makes it have kappa B. You make a lot of nitric oxide, you cause hypotension. So patients with septic shock are hypotensive because they're making too much nitric oxide. So you want to block the pathway. It plays a role in hormone secretion from the pituitary, from the pancreatic islands. It regulates insulin secretion from the beta cell in the, in the pancreas. We know it regulates a variety of genes uh, in transcription regulates the proliferation of stem cells. Um, it goes on and on and on. I just uh, obviously can't cover 160,000 publications in a short summary. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned something about nitric oxide. It's been an exciting molecule and a wonderful opportunity to discover novel drugs and improve therapy in a lot of important diseases. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk, I'm sure everybody will agree with me. Yeah. So we, we we can have a few questions and answers. Yeah. So so we had, uh, I invite the I would like to invite the floor for some questions. Uh, please uh, give your name and your affiliation and you can ask your question. Yes. Any questions from the floor? If you all understand it, I'm going to have an exam at the back of the room as you get out of the door. Yes, we have a young lady there. Please give your name and your affiliation. Uh, very good afternoon. So my name is Wong Sok Kwan. So I'm postdoctoral researcher from the Department of Pharmacology. So my question here is, uh, nowadays there are many over-the-counter supplements that claim to be able to 
boost liquid product, nitric oxide production in the body. So do this uh, supplement really works and what they necessary what uh, are they necessary and what are the potential benefits and also the adverse effects. There are many, many supplements out there. Uh, I've helped some companies over the years, for the past 15 years or more, make some of these supplements to provide the formulas. I can tell you that the more biochemistry we understand, the better the supplements are becoming. Because we're now learning about all the cofactors that participate in this pathway, more of the biochemistry. And some are much better than others because of that. They have a lot more antioxidants or other things to add to the, the cofactors to the nutritional supplements. Most of the data for their benefit comes from the laboratory or animal studies. Um, very little clinical data. There's some, but in my opinion, probably not enough. There have been positive, encouraging clinical studies, and there have been a couple that have been discouraging as well. And when I have worked with companies, I've encouraged them to do clinical trials to demonstrate the effectiveness of their therapy by measuring arginine levels in blood and urine, or by measuring nitrite or nitrate in blood or urine, to make sure we're making plenty of nitric oxide, and to look at some biological effects or hormone production. Now, the companies often shake their heads and say, yes, we'll help you do that, but then they don't. And I get upset with them because they don't. Uh, and I can understand, they're making so much money selling the supplements, they don't want to spend more money doing the clinical studies. And I think some of them are also a little concerned that maybe their product might, may not be quite as good as another product that enhances nitric oxide production more so than, than theirs, and they're going to damage their, 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 uh, control, their influence in the sales and the profit margins. So more studies are needed. I, honest, I'm a big study enthusiast. I think if you're going to do something and use it for patients, you have to demonstrate efficacy. Uh, and if it works, you should know it works so that you can say it works honestly. And I think it will help you win your market share. It will help you convincing governments for approvals. If it doesn't work, then maybe you need to change the formula and come up with a better product. So the views out there are sort of mixed. Uh, and as a hardcore scientist, I want to see the data. And they agree to do it, but they don't do it, which bothers me. Thank you, Dr. Murad. Yes? Hi, Dr. Murad. Thank you for your lovely lecture. My name is Pyrus from the Department of Anatomy UKM. I just would like to ask you one question, which is, uh, when you have your eureka moments, do you, do you ever think of Nobel Prize down the road? <laughs> we did that experiment in December 1976. 1976. And I knew it was very important. But I didn't appreciate how important. And a couple of my fellows <laughs> said, you're going to get the Nobel Prize. They told me that 76. in the late 70s. And I said, no, I don't, I don't, it's important, but I don't think it's that important. But it took me a few more years and I realized it really was more important. So probably by the mid-1980s, late-1980s, I thought it would happen. But then it took another 10 or 12 years for it to happen. <laughs> much for your sharing. I'm Leon, a pharmacology lecturer from Faculty of Dentistry, UKM. I have two questions for you and I'm more interested in your research than the supplements. The first questions would be, what was your biggest challenge in the journey of searching for nitric oxide? And second question would be, how confident you were in the right corrections of research? Thank you. The biggest mystery was to have a long list of agents that were regulating guanine cyclones. And we called these nitrobase dilators because they all possessed nitrogen, but they were quite different structures. You know, some were zinos, some were amines, some were nitrosos. 
they were quite different. Some were big molecules, some were small molecules. And I realized they all had to be converted to some common mechanism or factor. But I couldn't figure out what that was. Uh, and I would have never guessed there was going to be a free radical in our gas until we learned that the effects of all these agents were blocked by hemoglobin. That was the big tip-off. We then realized because hemoglobin blocked all of these effects and even blocked first got CDRF, which he had tested, he knew, he knew about our work, and hemoglobin blocked EDRF effects plus all of our nitrogen dialers, I realized that we were dealing with nitric oxide. They said, let's make nitric oxide and see if it works, and sure enough it did. The very first experiment we made, nitric oxide worked. And that was an exciting, exciting moment. But I tell you, no, but I didn't believe a gas could activate an enzyme because the dogma was it doesn't work, it shouldn't. You, know, you have oxygen that's carried by hemoglobin, but it, oxygen doesn't really regulate the activity of an enzyme. So it was a new concept, and that took a while for people to believe. Dr. Ellen? Alina Azizai from the Department of Health. Maybe um, uh, the supplement company wouldn't want to hear this question, but you mentioned several diseases where you actually want to block uh, an pathway, such as angiogenesis in tumors and so forth. So do you think in that regard, and all supplements with, that increases nitric oxide would be dangerous in the sense that you promote tumor and uh, good, good question. Uh, will supplements enhance NO in tumors so that it becomes more, more metastatic? Maybe. I don't know. We obviously need to do some clinical work and see. It might. So maybe those are patients who shouldn't get the supplement. I don't know. Or maybe you have to give the supplement in another way so that it selectively goes to one tissue and not another. And there are delivery systems that can do that, right? You can go with capsules that are enteric coated and only go in the GI tract, targeted to the liver and down other tissues. There are, there are various ways to do that with pumps and needles and delivery systems. Uh, but we need to do clinical studies to get that information. <coughs> and that really is a very good question. Could it be a bad thing in some cases? It may well be. But we don't know. That's why you have to take the basic science and research, which gives you the clues, and follow up with the appropriate clinical studies to make sure you're right. You can't make that leap and assume that everything clinically is going to work like it does in the laboratory. It may not. Complicated human body behaves differently. Different than a mouse or a rat, even. Thank you, Dr. Fred, for your uh, beneficial speech. Uh, I am Sora from Faculty of Medicine, Master's student. So, at low levels, nitric oxide uh, is very beneficial of the effect. But I, at high level, it is. Uh, Pro-oxidant or harmful. So, at what level can we say it is good or bad, and what are the parameters that uh, that can be measured to conform its change of role? Nitric oxide you behave both ways. It can be an oxidant by stealing electrons from other molecules, or it can be a reductant. Uh, it, you know, if, if it gets oxidized to uh, to nitric oxide to nitrite nitrate, it's going to reduce another molecule. If it steals an electron, it can be an oxidant. So it can go either way. Depends on the environment. Depends on the other chemicals in the environment and the players. With transition metals, it has a high affinity with transition metals. It likes transition metals: uh, zinc, manganese, copper, iron. Okay, one last question. Yes. 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 Yes.
We uh, many years ago developed a topical product to deliver nitric oxide to the skin. It's a gel that contains sodium nitrite and a second gel that has a weak acid with a pK between 4 and 5. And when you mix them, you release the nitric oxide from the nitrite. And we put it on burns and punch biopsies of mice and rats, and it accelerates wound healing. Uh, the wound in a rat or a mouse heals typically in about 14 days on average. And if you put nitric oxide delivery systems on that wound, it'll heal in about half the time. So we have now gotten interested in doing studies in humans. We did a pilot study in Taiwan actually a few years ago, and uh, it didn't look very good. And that's because I don't think the investigator was listening to our instructions about how to apply it. I think he was telling the nurses how to do it, and they probably were not doing it properly. And what you have to be careful is that when you apply it, say, twice a day, you have to cover it with saran wrap or something so it doesn't rub off on the sheets. And the, the gel comes off, it's not going to work, obviously. So I don't think they were doing it properly. There's been another company uh, that just in the last couple of years has come up with another mechanism to deliver nitric oxide topically. And have do, has done, they have done studies in diabetic ulcers. And the ulcers heal much more readily and, and faster. So I believe it works on wounds. And when we did the studies in mice and rats, <coughs> we found a number of things. It enhances the proliferation of the epithelial cells. It enhances stem cell recruitment into the wound. You can identify stem cell factors in, in the regulators. It promotes hair growth. It's angiogenic with more blood vessel supply. So there are a variety of reasons that we know that it's doing something in that wound. And when we look at the wound closure, it occurs in about half the time. So it is effective. But the clinical study that was done, that we tried to do, was not successful, but another company has been successful. And I'm now trying to repeat those studies at Stanford. And we have repeated what we did primarily in uh, those initial studies were done in uh, Houston many years ago. And what I'd like to do now is do another study at Stanford in humans uh, to see if we can sell the closure of the wound after, say, an appendectomy or a laparotomy or whatever, so we close those wounds faster with topical gel. And I think they'll close faster and be better. But that's a hypothesis. Until we have the data, I'm not sure. Okay, that's the last question from the floor. But I have the privilege of the very last question. <laughs> uh, Dr. Murat, you have been around for a very long time. Can you give just a few words of wisdom to the young researchers there uh, as to how to keep the passion in research uh, going on? Uh, I love research. Uh, I got hooked research, in research in college, actually. I had a biology professor who had an elective to work on a research project. And I decided I wanted to do some research for the first time. And he said, you know, there are fish that uh, have cartilage but no bony skeleton. How do they regulate their calcium metabolism? Because fish don't have a parathyroid gland. I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I went to the fish hatchery and got them, give me a lot of fish. And I put them in an aquarium with distilled water with no electrolytes, and they all died. <laughs> uh, so I didn't do the experiment properly. And then as the semester was ending, I discovered in the literature that someone had discovered that the pituitary produced a factor to regulate calcium in cartilaginous fish without bony skeleton. So somebody had already done the right experiment. My experiment didn't work. But that got me interested in science to answer questions. And then when I teamed up with Earl Sutherland and Ted Rawl, it was really exciting because they had just discovered cyclic AMP. And it was the first intracellular messenger. 
And as a student, I was the one who did all those early hormones to show it worked through cyclic AMP. That was my work. That was why Sutherland got the Nobel Prize, because of my work as a student. And it was quite exciting. <laughs> Ted Wall, my other advisor, said, oh, you're at, you should have gotten the prize with Cyril Sutherland. I said, no, I'm a student. The students don't share prizes with their boss. <laughs> but anyway, I was fortunate to work with really wonderful mentors and advisors. Uh, I've trained 150 people in my laboratory. And uh, they become family. They've done very, very well. Some of them have created companies. Some are presidents of universities. They're from all over the world. Most of them have become chairmen in a variety of places, Japan, Russia, China, US. Uh, so it's exciting to do this together. And I don't like to do something that's been done before. To repeat what someone else has done is confirmation. That's not research. I, I take high risk. And I can afford to take high risk because I usually have a large team of people and some projects are more risky than others that we've been very, very productive. And I think with all the education, both in the laboratory and in clinical medicine, I think I have skills that many people don't have. I mean, I, I get ideas in the laboratory to help me with patient care and I get ideas from patients to help create ideas in the laboratory. So it's fun for me to go back and forth and I enjoy it. You have to enjoy it. <coughs> you have to have fun. But it is a lot of work. And you have to be patient. Uh, it took me, oh my God. My God. <laughs> more than 50 years of training to get the Nobel Prize. 50 years. <laughs> I trained for 16 years after high school, 12 years after uh, college. I've had as much training as a cardiovascular surgeon or a neurosurgeon. Uh, it's been fun. <laughs> and I'm now 82, and I'm still excited about research. So that's pretty Ooh. remarkable, too. Thank you. So I hand over to the MC for the next session. Thank you to our guest speaker, Slumber. Dr. Farid Murad, and uh, Jan Babakia Professor Dr. Iman Niwan, Niwan uh, Suleiman. Ladies and gentlemen, as a token of appreciation, we would like to invite Yang Bahagia Professor Dr. Sabarul Arfan Mokhtar, Deputy Director, Center of Partnership, Corporate Communication and Health Technopolis to accompany Yang Bahagia Professor Dr. Dr. Iramani Jamal, Pro Vice Chancellor, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Campus Paul Info, to autograph Dr. 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 Yeah, Let me make one more comment for the ladies in the audience. <clears throat> uh, I told you that the idea of Viagra was my idea many years before Viagra. <laughs> I didn't think it was very important <clears throat> to work on. I decided to work in other areas. <clears throat> but a few years ago, I realized that there was nothing for women. So I designed a product for women. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> <laughs> Today有很多人在现场,后面有很多来自不同背景的 
，很幸福，很开心。来给大家看一下现场，见证历史性的一刻。完了过后，我就要 say bye bye 了啦。给大家有机会一起参与，不懂大家能不能够明白？不过在那过程里面，大家应该会很珍惜 in a 在我们的身体里面。Okay, love.